Hello everyone, today we are going to be talking about metaethics. Metaethics is an important subfield of philosophy, of moral philosophy that is, that's related to normative ethics and applied ethics. So let's see how they're similar and different. So far in this course, we've talked about major normative theories in moral philosophy. We've looked at the deontology of Immanuel Kant. We've looked at the utilitarianism from John Stuart Mill and Jeremy Bentham. And we've looked at the virtue ethics from Aristotle. Now certainly for Kant, Mill, and Bentham, they were, they were attempting to provide a normative framework. They were trying to come up with a procedural principle that doesn't just describe how the world is, but tells us how the world should or ought to be. That's what makes a principle normative. It goes over and above saying how the world is and says how it should be. More specifically, it gives you a procedure for when you are at a moral decision point and you're trying to figure out what you should do. Wouldn't it be nice if we had a guiding ethical principle that could help us with all of our moral dilemmas? And for Kant, of course, that's the categorical imperative. And for utilitarians, that's the principle of utility. Aristotle, again, if we put him into a box, we could say something like, what would the virtuous person do? That's, at best, a normative procedural principle we could get from him. But again, his sh focus shifts away from the question, what should I do at a moral decision point? to the question, what kind of person should I be? What kind of character traits should I develop? And of course for him, those are the virtues. So that's normative ethics. Again, tries to give us a general principle that will underlie all of our moral practices. Answers questions, what should I do? Or in Aristotle's case, what kind of person should I be? When you apply these normative principles to specific cases, whether they be real world applications or we apply them to thought experiments, hypothetical cases, you're doing applied ethics. You're taking these principles and applying them. That's why it's called applied ethics. And you can apply it in your real life or you can apply it as we often philosophers love to do in these moral hypotheticals, these thought experiments. So if you find a wallet on the street and you're trying to figure out what should I do, that's applied ethics. It's a, a real world, concrete, very specific sort of morality. If you're trying to decide, if you're at the grocery store and you're shopping for eggs and the ones that are uh, free range or eggs from free range chickens but they're more expensive do you spend the extra money because in your mind that would mean the, the the life that the chicken has is in some sense better in a moral sense than uh than some of the more inexpensive eggs that's an issue of applied ethics and so that's one of the points of the normative theories you know like the categorical imperative the principle of utility is the hope, the promise, is that it will deliver an answer to all of those questions, all of those moral dilemmas. Now, if we take a step back and we think more theoretically or more generally about ethics, about moral philosophy, then we're wading into the waters of meta-ethics. So this is the most theoretical sort of moral philosophy. So if you think of these three as distinct categories or if they bleed into each other, if we think of it like a fader switch, then when you are dealing with the most concrete, the most specific, the most real world, you're probably doing applied ethics. And if you slide the fader to the other end of the spectrum and you're doing something that's not specific at all it's much more general and much more zoomed out 
and much more hypothetical, theoretical, then you are probably doing meta-ethics and normative ethics is somewhere in between. What you just, what you really need to remember about normative ethics is instead of describing the world, saying this is, this is how it is, you're saying how things ought to be. And specifically with utilitarians, deontologists, you get an answer and what you should be doing is, you know, doing your duty or respecting persons or respecting autonomy or rights in the case of someone like Kant, or you are trying to maximize utility or happiness. Take Go down the path that will maximize the good consequences, you know, for, for everyone, maybe even uh, anim, non-human animals, all sentient beings. So that's normative ethics. So you might be thinking, what are some examples of these really hypothetical, general questions that are metaethical? Well, what are some of the most abstract questions you can ask in this field? What exactly do moral philosophers do at the end of the day? That's a metaethical question. What's the relationship between the domain of facts, the domain of the natural world, and the moral domain are they connected are they kind of the same way are they two sides of the same coin what's the relationship between the two that's a very abstract theoretical theoretical question that's a meta ethical question when you are learning about the normative theories, when you're learning about the categorical imperative, or you're learning about the principle of utility, or you're learning about virtue ethics, let's say you're trying to decide which one you prefer, or you're trying to step outside yourself and think, are which of these wins out if they were if they were going to compete against each other? Uh, which of them has the fewest objections? You know, which of them, you know, which of them falls prey to some of the troubling thought experiments that we've covered? You're doing meta-ethics when you're, you're thinking in that way. You know, a, a lot of, a lot of undergraduates who are studying philosophy and studying ethics, they often wonder if morality is relative, culturally relative maybe, or they wonder if there's morality in some absolute sense, some objective sense. So whether or not there are moral rules, let's say, that are universal, that span across cultures, times, and places, that's a meta-ethical position. And uh, if that's incorrect, if morality is subjective in some sense or relative to cultures or eras or places that's also a, a theoretical position about about ethics itself so that's a meta ethical question so oftentimes the questions that are what we might describe as reflexive or they are kind of self referential or meta in some sense that's why we have that's the prefix there we're doing meta ethics so again, applied ethics, it addresses everyday questions about ethics, very concrete, very on the ground, where the rubber hits the road. Uh, you know, this is where philosophy, you know, leaves the ivory tower, if you will, and can have things to say about, you know, what really matters in life in a, in a day-to-day, in an everyday sense. The relationship between facts and values, which I mentioned before, that is a deep, general, theoretical question in ethics. So that's a meta-ethical question. So if you think about, remember those films, uh, Jurassic Park, you know, they keep making sequels to that. So obviously that's a very lucrative uh, franchise. So in the, in the original film, which was based off a book by Michael Crichton, by the way. So in the original film and the and the book, scientists figure out a way to bring dinosaurs back 
through some sort of genetic manipulation and cloning, right? So the mosquito that built that bit the dinosaur gets preserved in amber for tens of millions of years, just quite fantastical, right? But that's, I mean, that's that's an amazing premise. And so eventually, they these scientists they they figure out how to reverse engineer, how to clone, whatever the proper terminology would be, how to how to make a dis- engineer dis- a dinosaur in present day. So the question of how do you do it? How do you, you know, what's the what's the biology and the bioengineering? What's the the actual science behind you know bringing back a Tyrannosaurus Rex, let's say, or a Velociraptor? That's an empirical question. That's a question of the natural world, and um, so so right now we don't have that technology. So um, it's not a fact to say that present day scientists can clone a Tyrannosaurus Rex, but someday. It might be the case that we can do it, and that's just a matter of fact. Now, should we do it? You know, is that a good idea, morally speaking? Is it morally okay to bring back species that been, have been extinct for tens of millions of years? Now, that's now that's a moral question. That's an ethical question. And to answer it, you can't really use the scientific method. You could do science until you're blue in the face, and you're not going to have an answer to that question. You have to think philosophically. You have to think critically. You have to reflect and think and write and um, converse and correspond with other people. You have to go through the work. You have to do philosophy, specifically ethics or moral philosophy. And that difference between the factual and the moral or the, 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 the world of values, moral values, that that distinction is 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 very theoretical so it's a it's a meta ethical distinction you might say okay we're going to transition now and talk about a subfield of meta ethics or at least an area of moral philosophy that very much overlaps with meta ethics and that is the area known as moral psychology so if you if you reflect on your mental states if you think about the times in your life when you're heavily motivated by reason and other times where it seems like your gut or you, you have a gut feeling or an intuition or it's an emotional state you can almost feel your feel it in your gut it's visceral your heart pumping and there's a strong desire there, perhaps, that really is the driving force, the the impetus behind uh, something that you're doing. So those are very different experiences. You know, so, um, I don't know, this just popped up in my head, but let's say you're taking, you have a math class and you're taking an exam in in a math class and you're, you're so the behavior is just maybe uh, maybe it's a multiple choice question about you know some algebraic formula a b c d what's the answer you know is it x x squared x cubed or x to the fourth you know something something like that and you know if you relied on your emotions or your your uh, your desire or your feelings, you know, you're kind of getting getting a feeling about, oh, I'm feeling good about A, or, you know, ooh, ooh, the C option is kind of freaking me out, <laughs> you know, it's a, bit, it's a bit silly. It would be much more prudent if you just, you know, used your logic and your reason to, to go through the problem and probably how you were trained by your professor, teacher, whatever, and use that to get you to fill in the the correct bubble. So there are times where acting out of reason is probably the best way to go. If, if If you can act out of reason, we're actually gonna talk about a difficulty with that. And then other times, it's 
you know, there's a saying that some people lead with their heart. And, um, you know, this is the idea of the, the, the romantic person who just wears their heart on their sleeve. They're very emotional in nature. And um, it can get people into trouble, right? Because emotion is tied to desire and can succumb to temptation. But, um, you know, we probably need people like this. And, um, you know, we wouldn't have any uh, artists, musicians, or poets, right? If, if everyone was just overly analytical and, you know, just kind of, acted purely out of reason you know we'd be more like uh, logic machines and and robots and computers than we would uh, uh, human beings so moral so what does this have to do with moral psychology well philosophers are interested in motivation because even if theoretically we know what the right thing to do is that doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to do it, right? I mean, how often in your life do you know maybe what you should have done, but you didn't do it? And why is that? Well, maybe it was temptation or maybe you got a little selfish. You know, you know, you so like the found wallet example. So you found a wallet. It's got like 500 bucks in it. And maybe somewhere inside of you, you know that you should try to get it back to its owner. But maybe that selfish side of you wins out and you just keep the money all right or you know a lot of people they'll compromise right they'll they'll um <laughs> they'll take the money out and then you know maybe there's an ID and they find the person and they give the wallet back and uh, then they get a little bit of best of both worlds right because maybe the person is happy to get their their wallet back you know and they look and there's no cash in it and and they say oh you know you didn't find the cash wasn't in there was it and then you say no, I don't know what you're talking about. Nope, I guess somebody probably just took the cash and then left the wallet there, and then I found the wallet. And so, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's just kind of funny because we've all been in situations like that. I mean, the temptation is is real. Okay, so we we want to figure out what the right thing to do is, and then we got to get people to actually do it so how do we make that happen and is it more a function of the analytical logical thinking side of us you know is it a function of our beliefs like do we have moral beliefs uh, and do we do we act out of moral beliefs or act out of reason our moral reasonings or something perhaps uh, someone like David Hume is definitely going to take issue with that, which we will learn about later. Uh, someone like him would say, no, it's really our heart, our gut, our sentiment, our passional nature, our desire. That's what motivates us to act. That's just not that's not just our moral psychology. That's just that's just being a human being. That's just our human psychology. When Whenever we do anything, anything that's intentional, there's going to be a desire there. That's what someone like uh, David Hume or a neo-Humean uh, might might say. Who would disagree? Well, someone like Immanuel Kant, he argued for the existence of something that he called pure practical reason. And remember when I talked about doing the math problem and then filling out that, that that answer. Let's say you go with you go with B x squared. I think is what I said. And so, what drove you to pick that? You know, was it was it an emotion inside of you, or uh, did you reason out that that was the correct answer and that's what that was what was behind your actual behavior? You know, you, you penciling in. Uh, B. So um, that would be an example of being motivated by reason. And, th and Kant thought that this does exist and it's particularly important for acting ethically. Because, like I mentioned, there are times where 
you know what the right thing is, or at least you think that you know what the right thing is. And, um, and even the, uh, even though you, you know, it's the right thing to do, you're tempted to not do it right with the, like with the wallet case, you, maybe your desire is pushing you, you know, you think it's a visceral, you could feel, you could feel the temptation, you feel it inside your body and you want to just keep the money. But those times where, you know, we might say your conscience wins out and you don't succumb to that temptation to just keep the money and you find the rightful owner and you give it back. For someone like Kant, he might say, ah, this is an example of what he called pure practical reason. You acted ethically and... What got you to act ethically, it wasn't desire because desire was tempting you to keep the money. And yet you didn't keep the money. You gave it back. And so all that's left in your psychology would be a, a moral, uh, like you reasoned out, you might say, that that was the right thing to do. And that was behind your action. Or maybe it was a belief. Like you just... You believed, perhaps even you knew that was the right thing to do. And that's what got you to give the money back. It was that belief. So that describes the Kantian position. Now, if you're someone like David Hume, you might say, Oh, Kant, you're not telling the whole story there. There's... you. Whenever you tell with that version of the story, you conveniently left out some desire because for someone like Hume, behavior, at least intentional behavior, so uh, setting aside things like, like you know, is, um, you know, like a knee-jerk reaction, like the doctor hits that your it's your knee with the hammer and then it, it goes out. You know, is that behavior? Okay, sure. But, um, you know, you're not, there's no intention behind that. You don't really, it's involuntary, right? You know, like your heart beating, is that, is that your body behaving? Is your blood pumping? Is that, are you doing something? You know, sort of, I mean, it's your heart. It's your circulatory system. But, um, <laughs> it's like, I'm trying, I'm, I'm, I'm intentionally pumping my own blood right now. <laughs> I mean, maybe I am, you know, and, uh, and maybe sometimes you can, you could get that to happen. You know, like, I guess if I really focus, I suppose I could get my heart to speed up or slow down. I mean, isn't that kind of, um, you know, what yogis do and, uh, or, or, you know, anyone who, who knows a little bit about meditative states or thinking, you know, you know, you kind of. Focus on your breath and breathe in for this amount of seconds. Hold it for this and then breathe out. And then it's like you kind of are intentionally slowing your heart down. Okay, okay, setting that stuff aside. Um, or no, I mean, including that. You know, if you, if you could, anything you could do on purpose, that's what we're talking about. Uh, things that you do intentionally on purpose. That sort of behavior. For someone like Hume, necessarily there will be a desire there. So if you ever do something on purpose, some part of you wanted to do it. That's that's Humean psychology. Now, he wrote in the 18th century, and psychology has, I mean, the field didn't even really exist back then. Maybe some sort of proto-psychology, but, um, you know, it's only like, a hundred and some odd years old, you know, depending on where you count the starting point. So um, maybe we know better now. But um, but yeah. So so Kant he believed that reason and or belief alone could motivate you to do the right thing. And Hume says no way. So he he has this line in one of his books on ethics that says that. 
that reason is the slave of the passions. You know, he, there's even more hyperbole. You know, it's something like reason is and ought to be. Like that's its place. You know, know your place, reason. You are a slave to the passions, to desire that is, and you should be rightful and rightfully so. <laughs> it's a slave of the passions. So, so that was uh, the Hume side of things, and so we can we can start to come up with this picture and. For simplicity's sake, you know, I'm kind of putting a line down the middle of these two different these views, but it doesn't have to be that car compartmentalized. You know, we can have things can overlap and, and bleed over and our psychology, it can be much more sophisticated than it's either reason or emotion and they they have no relation to each other. So a lot of philosophers are interested in kind of where the wires get crossed and they come up with terms like uh, a belief slash desire you know and they make the what's that called like a, a portman portmanteau of that and uh, it becomes bizarre so that's belief plus uh, desire yeah so but um so yeah that's that stuff's out there but for you know for for what we're doing just while we're learning, we'll kind of keep these things separate. And so on one side of this view, you've got the Kantian, pure practical reason. We're talking about cognition and thinking and beliefs and logic and, you know, the analytical mental states. For Hume, it's going to be, you know, the opposite, if you will. It's going to be emotion. And so we're, going, we're, we're, we're pitting reason versus emotion, which I think at least on an experiential level, we all can kind of relate to. And that's why I, I gave the example of what it's like when you're doing a math problem versus you know, what it's like when you are tempted by something or, you know, you, you know, just think about your desires when you have basic needs, you know, so when you're dying of thirst and then you go and you you quench that thirst you know what's that's desires pushing you or you're t exhausted and then you you know you finally you know hop into bed or something that was desire driving that or you're, you're really cold and then you, it, it drives you to go somewhere warm or you're starving and you, you you know you you go to eat something that's when you're really being driven by desire um, a question about truth. So, so, so let's let's tie this to morality. So, are there moral beliefs? Now, beliefs are the sorts of things that philosophers say are truth apt. A P T. Truth apt, meaning that they are the sorts of things that can be true. It's apt, it's appropriate to say of a belief that, not all of them, but of some beliefs that they are true, you know, and then the ones that are not true are are false, you know. So, so, so like a, a, a neo-Kantian might say, well, of course there are moral beliefs, you know, like um, the belief that, um, you know, child neglect is morally wrong. You know, so I have that belief. I'm sure you have that belief. Child neglect, child abuse is wrong. So I believe that, and that's a moral belief that's true. So that's what people in this camp, they might say things like that. So there's room in these moral theories for moral truth and moral beliefs. And so the name for this group of people or the school of thought is cognitivism cognitivism and what's behind the name that word you know cog cog in the machine um you know kind of mechanistic thinking computer-like thinking analytical thinking logical thinking cognition that's uh that's why it's called that but if you are a moral cognitivist, then there's room for these things in um, in your moral philosophy. 
If you reject that, maybe you're someone like Hume or a disciple of Hume, then you're saying no to that. You're a non-cognitivist. You would endorse non-cognitivism. And if that's your cup of tea, then at the end of the day, in terms of moral motivation, it's going to be not thinking, belief, logic. It's going to be emotion, desire. And unlike beliefs, desires, presumably, are not truth apt. So we say of a belief, like, oh, what you think, what you believe is wrong, it's incorrect, it's false. You know, so if I believe that Earth, the Earth is larger, has more mass than Jupiter, that belief's incorrect, it's wrong, it's false. If I believe the, the reverse, I believe the opposite, that Jupiter is larger than the Earth, that's true. That's something I believe that's true. If I have a desire for a glass of water or to sit by the fire, if we wouldn't say of that desire that it's true, oh, that was a true desire, or think about that, that was a false desire. No, desires just kind of are there. We don't really say, we don't really say true or, we don't label them in that way. It would be funny to do so. And so, um, so they're not in the, the philosophical jargon. They're not truth apt. So there's little to no room for truth in ethics. And that's a big deal because for probably more philosophers than not, it does seem like there are moral truths. I mean, maybe maybe we're mistaken. Maybe that's a fallacy. And that's what some people write about. But, you know, like if I say, um, I believe that a human should not enslave other humans. You, I think a lot of us would say, oh yeah, uh, I'm glad you believe that. And also I would say that that's true. Now we'll talk about different maybe levels of truth or um, depth of truth, you know, when you say, is that just kind of like an individualistic truth? Is that like a cultural truth? You know, what does it mean to, what does it even mean to say that? Is this kind of like a truth, capital T, you know, kind of like in a very, uh, very deep sense, maybe even a metaphysical sense, metaethical sense, you know, or when you, when you, are moral truths, if they exist, are they akin to truths of the natural world? You know, are they like, like, are there moral rules or moral laws just like there are natural laws? You know, so it's like Einstein discovered E equals MC squared, you know, Newton discovered F equals MA, force equals mass times acceleration. You know, so that's the list of natural laws you know, next to it or near it or below it or above it, would we add uh, moral laws, you know? you know? Is that what kind of like, you know, maybe that's why those commandments that showed up that show up in um, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, and, and lots of other places, maybe that's why they stuck around for so long because they are kind of etched in not just stone, but kind of etched into the world, you know? So it's like uh, equals MC squared, comma, slavery is wrong, or child neglect is wrong, or or dishonesty is wrong, or helping others is morally good, something like that. Well, if that's sounding at least somewhat plausible to you, then this school of thought from David Hume is gonna it's gonna be an uphill battle. It's gonna be a struggle. To explain that, because that's not really supposed to exist. If there's no room for truth or beliefs in ethics, and then how do you reconcile that with the fact that, hmm, at least in some cases, maybe there are some of these moral laws. 
it's much easier for someone coming from a, a Kantian like framework to deal with that. But they will have some struggles as well. There will be objections leveled against the cognitivist because while we have a entire enterprise and disciplines within disciplines that are dedicated to the verification of natural laws, natural facts, beliefs about the natural world, namely the scientific method, we don't seem to have the equivalent for would-be moral laws. You know, you, you could do science to verify, oh yeah, Jupiter, it has to have more mass than the Earth because, and then you look at all this evidence and data. What would the equivalent be for morality? You know, maybe we have something like that. Maybe we talk about moral intuitions. You know, it doesn't seem like it can just be doing a poll or a popularity contest because like in the case of slavery, humanity voted and it depends on, like if you look at the vote now, it depends on where you go in the world, which is which is sad. But if you look at the, if you look at the, um, the people's, what the people will say now, okay, now people are on board with the don't enslave others. But if you go back a few centuries, that's not what a lot of people were saying, even the majority of a lot of places, you know, even like in a biblical sense, you know, I brought up Judeo, uh, you know, Christian moral ideas, you know, even in like a Hebrew scriptures, Old Testament sort of sense, uh, you know, that wasn't one of the, <laughs> it wasn't one of the top 10, if you will, moral rules. You know, it was like, don't be overly, I'm not paraphrasing, don't be overly nasty to your slaves. There's something, there's stuff like that in there, but you didn't have the prohibition on it, full stop. So, um, so, 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 so we don't have a, a, a moral scientific method, if you will. I mean, that doesn't quite make sense, but if you, a, a moral version of the scientific method, we don't seem to have, I mean, maybe, well, maybe we do. That's what philosophers are trying to, trying to figure, trying to figure out. Yeah. All right. That was pretty good. So, um, that was, that was wonderful. So thanks for hanging out with me. As always, don't forget to ask questions.